We have more than I had realized regarding forms. Um, we have to go over the um, rest of the tags for the form controls. We have to talk about uh, a grouping element that exists. We have to talk about formatting the form, styling the form that is. And we have to talk about HTML5 form controls. So let's go and for this particular example, I am not going, I'm going to stray away from the, the Bing search engine. I'm just going to make a form kind of by itself. All right. And we'll just submit back to itself. In web programming, that's called a post back. Oftentimes, a page will submit back to itself. And the page will have server side code that allows the page to work in two modes. One mode is to display the original form. And the second mode is to process the form. So we'll do that. Um, we will do that. And we will um, just, make the, just make the page post to itself. So let me start off by going in and creating a new page. Put the basic HTML tags on there. For those of you that are um, here, I guess, and those of you that are watching videos, don't, how do I want to say, remember to put these basic tags in. And again, the best way I've found to do that is as soon as you put a start tag, put an ending tag in. You don't know how many pages I get with like no end HTML tag, all right? Because probably people think, well, I'll put that in when I'm all done. All right, well, um, a lot of times you'll forget. So it's best as soon as you put in a start tag to put in the end tag. So here's our head section, which will at the very least contain a title tag. We are not going to do hologram anyone today. I'm no fun today. The second most common omitted tag is the end body tag. All right. So we're going to have a form tag because we're going to wrap up form entries into a package to send to the server. Now, method I'm going to use is get, so therefore it will pass it to the query string. And action, I'm going to make pound sign. Actually, no, I'm going to omit the action. If you omit the action, by default, it will submit the page back to itself. All right, so we'll do that. All right, and we'll see that in a second here. So we have our end form tag. And so far we've had something like this. I was going to put an input tag in. But since I have in the back of my mind that later on we're going to talk about styling the form and formatting the form, I'm going to actually put my form controls in an unordered list. Because if you think about it, that's really what a form is. It's a list of stuff that you have to enter in. Is it ordered or unordered? Well, there is somewhat a logical order, but it's not like a rigid logical order. Like, do I put name before email or email before name? Well, that could go either way. So in my mind, I'm going to call this an unordered list. So typically, what you do is you put your form elements within an unordered list. That will help when we get to styling it. And it all makes sense logically. So it's not just for style purposes. This really is a list of items. So my li tag, I'm going to put my label for
input type equals text, name equals name, and ID equals name. All right, then we're going to end our li. Whoops. The label again is for accessibility. We will know that the word name belongs to this text box because of the proximity on the screen. It's going to be right next to it. Someone who is using a screen reader and who's tabbing through the controls, they are not able to see the text that's next to the label, or that's next to the text box. Therefore, this label tag ties it for them. Now, in this case, I made the name and the ID the same thing. That's typically what I do, all right? But do know that the for needs to match the ID. The name is what the server is going to see. So it's going to see the name of name. All right. Then I can have an li. And I will put a submit button here. All right, so let's go and look at this. All right, I'm going to save it, and we're going to look at it. So I'll go to File, Save As. I'm going to save it on the desktop, and I'll call it form.html, cleverly enough. So this is going to be very similar to what we've done in previous examples. So if I open it up in the Google Chrome browser, we'll see a text field and go. All right. Now, you might say to yourself, I don't like how this looks. I don't like the bullet points and all that. To which I will respond, what? Yeah, it doesn't matter if you don't like what it, how it looks. All right. Boy, that sounded, that sounded hostile. That sounded like the rock. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you, yeah. Uh, it, uh, uh, it doesn't matter because we can control that via CSS. So remember, you do things that logically make sense, not things that you like the way it looks. All right. So in this case, we don't like the, the button or the, the bullet points, we'll get rid of them. All right. And then we can later on, we can organize this to do uh, and, and make it look the way that we would want it to. All right. Just to sort of close the loop here, if I type this in, click go. Remember, because this had no action, by default, the action is to, to submit to itself. And again, that may sound a little odd, uh, but when you study server-side scripting, you'll see that that's actually pretty common. And again, this is called a postback. So the code to handle the form is in the same page as the code that displays the form. All right, that makes it easier if there's validation and errors and that sort of thing. So notice the name corresponds to the name of the text box. The name corresponds to the name of the button. And the value corresponds to the value that I assigned the button. Right, let's put some other things in there. All right. Let's put a checkbox. So. And I don't know, what do we have as a checkbox here? Agree to terms and conditions that I won't read, yeah.
Joke's on them if they do that for me. <laughs> Shoot, if they do that to my real bank account, the joke's still on them, yeah. Exactly. Now, again, many of these form controls are done with the input tag and just a different um, type. Not all of them, oddly enough. Remember, I didn't make this up. I'm just explaining it to you. All right? So, for example, when we get to the drop-down, the drop-down is not an input. But radio buttons are with an input tag, and check boxes are with an input tag, and text boxes are with an input tag. So and submit buttons are with an input tag. So some of them use the input tag with a different type, some of them have their own tags altogether. And I suppose that made sense to someone at some time, but we gotta live with it regardless. All right, so I have input type equals checkbox. I give it a name and an ID. Again, the ID has to match the four on the label. Type equals check, checkbox. We'll make it a checkbox. The value of y, uh, of y indicates that when it's checked, it's going to have a value of Y when it gets to the server. When it's not checked, it's not going to have any value. All right. So let's save this and look at it. All right, and, pardon me? If I put a value in here, notice that there is nothing for the agree on there. All right, so if it's not checked, it doesn't get sent to the server. That creating the HTML form, it does matter when you get to server-side scripting. Now, if I check this, I do get agree equals y. Now here's something to notice. I'm going to put a y in the, in the text box and check this. Name equals y, agree equals y. All right. What I'm trying to illustrate is from the server side perspective, the server side doesn't know or care where the values came from. All right. In other words, everything that gets sent to the server gets sent to the server as the name of a variable equals and a value. Now that thing could be a text box, it could be radio buttons, it could be any number of things. But from the server's perspective, it doesn't care. It just knows that this thing has this value. So that's why I'm displaying the query string. Even the button follows that format. The name of the button equals the value. And if I had a different submit button, it would only show me the submit button that I pressed. That way I could have on a form like delete or update. And if one submit button was pressed, it would delete the record. If a different submit button was pressed, it would update it. Okay, now, I know we said a while ago, well, we'll, we'll continue building this. This is starting to look messy, though, all right? But we'll just note that it doesn't matter. We will CSSify it later on. All right, next thing. Let's do radio buttons. Radio buttons are also done with an input tag. I'm going to do the radio buttons, well, 
No, I'll do the labels along with the radio buttons. Input type equals radio. Now notice for the other ones, the ID and the name were the same. It didn't really matter. Here the ID and the, and the, the name are going to be different. All radio buttons in this group are going to share the same name. That's what makes them a radio button group, the fact that they all have the same name. That's what makes them so that if you click one, the others go off. If I gave them different names, then they would act independently. However, I have a unique ID to tie the label to the radio button. So ID equals L County name equals county. And then I could do it for Cuyahoga County. I forgot one thing. I need the, the value on the radio button as well. I think I pasted something wrong. Label for L County, Lorain County resident, and then input blah, 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 blah. Oh, I, I pasted it twice. That's what I did. I was thinking ahead to the next one. Then I'll do another choice. So let's let's look at these radio buttons. Look at one one of them. Let's look closely at one of them. Let's look at the Lorraine one. Type equals radio that designates it's a radio button. L County. It needs a distinct ID for two reasons. First of all, IDs by definition are distinct. In other words, there shouldn't be two things that have the same ID. Secondly, if you think about it, I need this ID to match up with this so that the form control ties to the label for accessibility reasons. Name of county. Well, that matches the other one's names. And that's what makes things a radio button group. It doesn't have anything to do with, like, are the buttons close to each other or whatever. You could have a radio button on the top of the page and a radio button on the bottom of the page. If they had the same name, they would work together as a group. All right? So I have to make sure the name 
for this radio button matches the name for this radio button matches the name for this radio button. And then each one of them needs to have their distinct value. That value is the value that's going to get passed to the server if that radio button is selected. So let's look at this. This works as a radio button. As I check one, the other becomes unchecked. I can put a name in. I, I click submit. Name equals whatever. County equals Lorraine, because that's what I picked. Agree equals Y. Submit button equals go. So this works like a, ra uh, a radio button in that um, you can only select one. If I stop and gave these a different name. Then, I could check them individually. So if you can do that, you messed up. All right? Also, we talked about only having one in a group, like for toppings on a pizza, for example, hypothetically, if you had to do that sort of assignment. You wouldn't use radio buttons because if you check pepperoni, you could never change your mind and say, oh, no, you know, I don't want pepperoni. Yeah, exactly. So, again, whether you do this via a radio button or drop down is a matter of real estate. All right? In this case, I have the, the three options, just the three options. So it kind of makes sense to put those out there. Now, if I literally was allowing the person to select any county in Ohio, all right, uh, radio buttons probably wouldn't be the way to go. You'd probably use a drop down then. All right. So we have two more that we're going to talk about now. All right. Three more that we're going to talk about now. All right. One of them is the drop-down. Now, the drop-down is one of them that has a different tag. The drop-down has a pair of tags. We have a select tag that defines, here's our drop-down. We have an options tag that defines, um, here's a list of options for this drop-down. So, let's make a drop down for um what should we make a drop down for? favorite number. Yeah. Favorite hologram. I'm going to extend that. The favorite virtual person. Because I want to put Max Headroom in the, in the running. Ah, okay. All right. Really, I wanted to have more than two choices. All right. Favorite virtual person. And there's these, aren't they, they're like virtual pop stars in Japan? Yeah, I was going to say, I remember like seeing that once and I wasn't sure if I was dreaming or what, but. <laughs> All right. All right, select ID equals, our ID is going to have to match the ID of the label, virtual. Our name is going to be how the value is going to get passed on the query string. And I could make that the same. Again, if, I, I apologize if it's confusing and I'm making the same. I'm just doing what I normally do. When I normally create a form, I make the IDs match the name with the exception of radio buttons where you can't do that. All right. 
Um, and then we have our list of options. Our options consist of two parts. What user and what's going to get passed to the server. All right. Those of you that have done any data, have anyone done database stuff at all? Okay. Um, that has important implications like if you're doing uh, a web form that connects to the database. For example, let's go back, you know, let's say you wanted to um, select from a list of courses on, uh, you know, on Elsie's website. Courses, you would identify courses by their name, right? Introduction to C-sharp, introduction to web development, client-server scripting, accounting, and so on. Internally in the system, though, there's like a code number for them, like CISS 216. Now, people don't always know, like, the code number, all right? Or think if you're ordering on Amazon. Un undoubtedly, there's some sort of product number on Amazon. And if you want to order something, you know, you know the thing that you want to order. You don't necessarily know the product number. But the script may need that product number to make things work. Or in the case of LC, the script may need that course ID to make things work. So we kind of have a case of humans don't necessarily want to see the same information that the script needs to do its job. So therefore, with these options, you have the ability to put both in. So, for example, if I make an option tag and I say a value of MH, I can put in there max headroom. If I just said MH, a user might not realize that's what I meant. And just copy it for more options. Hopefully remembering to change the things. Holographic Michael Jackson. Hologramic? Or graphic. Hologram. Holo. Hologram. Hologram Michael Jackson. That's how you spell his last name, right? All right. Yeah, okay. Good. All right. So all these, there's one select that says, here's my group of options. And then within that select, there's options. It's important to include the value. I've seen cases where they don't include the value. And when they don't include the value, this gets used for both. What's between the start and end option tag. And again, what the difference is, is what's between the start and end option tag is what the user is going to see. All right? What is set as a value is what the script is going to see. So let's go and save it. And there we go. And we can pick what we want. And if we submit it, notice HMJ shows up there. All right. Next thing is a text area. A text area is for multiple lines of text. Text box is for a single line of text. So things such as comments, yeah, like if you're posting to a discussion forum, yeah, absolutely.
And again, not, I don't know why there just isn't a different type of input tag, but there isn't. Text area ID equals comments. Name equals comments. I don't know why, but I've found that if I use the shorthand of, of putting the ending tag as part of the starting tag, I've had bad experiences with that in text areas. So I always explicitly put in the end text tag. If you wanted to put like some default, like a message that says, please enter, a, uh, um, please enter um, your comments here, then you'd put it between the start and end text area. I usually don't do that. All right, and there we go. We don't like the way that size doesn't matter. We can resize it via CSS. Now notice that we can go on typing in here forever. All right. Is there a way to limit how much we can type into a text box? Y yes but not via HTML. I was going to say, no, we can't, but you're right. There is a way, right? There is a way, right? Because Twitter does it, right? You can't go more than 140 characters, and they probably have a text box there. But you can't do it just with plain old HTML. The text box, by definition, is unlimited. If you want to limit that, then you have to put JavaScript in. Likewise, if I wanted to make sure that the user picked one of the residency uh, counties, I would have to put JavaScript to validate that. I could default by giving, uh, by setting one of them to be checked. I could say checked equals checked. And that would check one of them and then I'd have a default. All right? So I could do this on the radio button. If, for example, this is a web page for Lorain County Community College, I'm not really sure why we would be that concerned who your favorite virtual person is here at LC, but we might. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. For science, yeah. We can say checked equals checked. And I could make, when I load the page, Lorain County resident the default. Notice that again. This defaults to the top one on the list. Um, a, 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 a drop down always has a value. So if you do not specify by saying selected on an option, selected equals selected, then the top one is. Now if you don't want the top one to be the default, you have to go in and put a dummy value in. And then you'd have to put um, JavaScript to make sure they picked something other than the dummy one. And then you can pick that. Now, a word about defaults. This will make more sense when we, uh, when we talk about JavaScript, either in this class or in other classes. But you should make your defaults for good reasons. All right? Let me give you an example of a good reason and not a good reason. I made Lorain County resident the default. If this were a web page for Lorain County Community College, that would probably be a reasonable thing to do because I don't have the numbers, but I would say overwhelming majority of people that attend here are from Lorain County. There are people from Cuyahoga County and there are people from Edina County and Erie County and that, but it's safe to say that most people coming to this page, if it was for something here at LC, would be from Lorain County. So it's legit to, to type in a, or or to, to select a, a default. If it wasn't so sure, if it wasn't so definite, 
if this was just, say, a, a business in Westlake or something, where maybe some of its patrons came from Lyon County, some of it came from Cuyahoga County, I should not say, hmm, I'm going to make a default so that that will force the user to select something, right? Because if there's no defaults in a radio button, the user can select nothing, all right? And I haven't learned JavaScript yet, so therefore, I am going to not include, a, or I'm going to include a default just to make sure I, ha I don't have to write validation. Or differently, in the case of a dropdown, I'm going to leave off that please select because I want to force the user to pick something. There, you're misleading. In that second situation I described, where I was a, a store that was, let's say, very close to the border of Lorraine and Cuyahoga County, you could not make a good assumption that most of the people visiting were from one place or another. They'd probably be fairly evenly split. Likewise, you certainly can't make any assumptions about who their favorite virtual person is. So therefore, a default for that would not be appropriate. So you default when there is really a reasonable suspicion on your hand that that is going to be the option that people are going to take most of the time. If you don't default, you make people work a little harder entering the form that, than, they, than they should have to. If you do default and you shouldn't, all right, then you're going to run the risk of people not entering, not looking at that and getting distorted data. So for example, if I defaulted to max headroom, all right, um, a lot of people might just breeze over that and Max Headroom would end up getting a lot of votes that he didn't necessarily deserve. I realize that that part of the discussion sort of ver you know, verges on the absurd uh, thing here, but you get the point. All right, if you make something a default and it's not really the default, some people are going to be lazy and click through it, and therefore what you've made the default is going to get more selections than you really need. All right. What other things do we have? Ah, password. Now, these what I'm going over today are form tags that have been around forever. Okay? So, these are pre-HTML5. When we look at HTML5 stuff next week, we will see some new, some new things, for example, to limit to a number or to um, allow a limit force a date. Right now, using pre-HTML5, if we wanted the user to enter in a date, they'd have to use a plain old text box. How would we make sure they entered a date? We'd have to do it via JavaScript. Type equals password. What that does is that doesn't echo the characters back. So if I go and type in, I get the dots there. Now, notice this, that it passes it on the query string, which probably isn't a good idea, all right? So I would use a method of post if I was passing a, a password, all right? I'm using a method of get just so that we can see the data that gets passed. But if you're passing a password, you would never want to use get. All right, let's start styling this, all right? We're going to, yeah, we're going to spend a little bit of time styling this. We'll wrap that up on Tuesday. In addition, on Tuesday, we will talk about grouping form fields together, and we will talk about HTML5 controls. All right, first thing, right off, let's get rid of the bullet points. How do we do that? And I am going to, and I know... Do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to put my style tag right in the page. Yes, I am. 
how do I make sure that there are no bullet points? Does anyone know? List style type on what attribute? Okay, UL. All right, UL, list style type. If you didn't know that, what would you do? Well, you'd Google it. All right. And what would be a good Google search term for this? If we wanted to look this up, if we didn't know. CSS remove bullets from UL. There we go. Someone posted a Stack Overflow for this? Come on. Oh, but they have using jQuery. Ouch. All right. Yeah, and here's the answer. Yeah, right there. So, as was stated, again, keep in mind that the thing, you know, very few people, if anyone, has, you know, most or certainly not all of CSS memorized. You, you remember the things that you use a lot and everything else you look up. It really is a skill to figure out how to Google stuff. And again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I hope you don't think I'm talking down to you, but that's something that you do need to develop and, and you do need to, to hone your skills for doing that. So at the very least, you know that it has something to do with a UL and an LI. And at the very least, you know it's going to be via CSS because it has to do with the appearance. So that's why what we put in was a good search term. All right, so we do that. And there we go. All right. I don't like the way these text boxes are sort of jaggedy. All right. How could I correct that? How could I make this form line up really neat? Well, what if I gave the labels a constant width? So I'm going to say label width 100px. does absolutely nothing. And I leave in disgrace with, with, with my head, head down. Why didn't it do nothing? Why, why didn't it do nothing? Why did it do nothing? What kind of tag is label? Okay, it is. That's true. Well, well, what kind, there, there's two main kinds of tag. There's two kinds of tags. What are those two kinds of tags? Block and inline. All right. What kind of tag is a label? Inline, right? Because if you notice, the labels are right next to the text box. So they're in line. Width is only an attribute that we can set on inline tags. So... I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this must be opposite day or something. Width is an attribute that we cannot set on inline tags. We can only set it on block tags. So, is my solution to make it block? I could, but I'm not going to like how that looks. There is actually, and this almost sounds like something that a kid would make up, you know, there's a block in line. Yeah, yeah, I'll make a block in line. Therefore, when I want it to behave like a block tag, it will behave like a block tag. When I want it to behave like an inline tag, it will behave like an inline tag. So, I can say display and what I don't remember if it's block in inline or inline block. Yeah, inline block and why it rocks, yeah. So, we know it rocks, so it must be the right one to, to use. 
because we want to rock and form. And I almost typed in inline rock. <laughs> it's been a long week. I did catch up on grading now. Yeah, I caught up. And again, if you did not get full credit, you're welcome to rework stuff. All right? And knock on wood, I will not be this far behind ever again in my life, but specifically this semester as well. Um, if you have me in another class, please disregard that message because I'm still catching up in, <laughs> in a couple other classes. But for this class, we're fine. All right. Ah, looky there. Not bad, huh? What would do it better? What would make this even better still? What if we push this guy right along here? So right now, this aligns and this aligns. What if we made the E of name and the D of password and the S of terms and all that line up? Let's try that. How do I do that? Text align, right. <laughs> Don't you hate that? Yeah. All right. And now, boom, that goes like this. Now, the only thing that's a little off is the Lorain County resident bit. I mean, it's not really a little bit off, but it kind of is kind of an oddball. All right? How do we do that? Well, what I can do, the, the, how do I want to put this? The, the, the general answer is that we want to treat those labels differently than the rest of the labels. So, how do we treat one group of tags differently than another group of tags that are the same? An ID would be one way. What might be a better way? Ooh, he's going to the notes. No? No? What, what's a, what, what are different ways that we can differentiate between tags? We can differentiate by the tag name. Well, not the type. We can, by the ID. <laughs> not one, but more than one, a class. All right? An ID isn't a bad solution, and we could get it to work, but we'd have to give a different class for each one. All right? Oh, I'm sorry, we'd have to give a different ID for each one. In this case, there's a whole class of things that I want to treat a different way. Specifically, it would seem to me that all my labels associated with radio buttons, I want to not treat the same way. So, maybe I do this. Dot RB label. Display inline. And then I would go in for these labels and say class equals RB label. Because I have a sneaking suspicion if I had another group of radio buttons, I'd run into the same sort of thing with them. So now I have a class for that. Now notice that, and again, this is a subtle point, but this is like, it's like a pro tip. All right? Pro tip. Notice that the name of my class isn't something like inline label or wide net label, or narrow label, or something like that. Notice I'm not describing what it's going to look like. I'm describing why I am creating this class. I'm creating this class because I want to handle radio button labels differently. Just like, for example, if I had a warning on the page, 
and I made the warning red. All right? I would not call the class that did that red text. All right? Why not? Because what if I decided to make the warnings twice, a big, twice as big a font instead of making it red? Then I have a, a class called red text that doesn't make the text red. And that would be really confusing. All right? In addition, I might make text red for other reasons, too. So, if I were to change red text then, I'd change everything that I wanted to make red. Whereas, if I made it warning, then I would change and it would only change every warning. So now if we do this, for our last iteration here, we have that, which isn't bad. Alright? We can play around with this and we can make it look better still. We'll wrap up the styling of this. But as you can see, we're moving definitely in the right direction. All right? With a few more tweaks, um, we should have a, a fairly decent looking form. Any questions on this? All right. See you over for lab.